three, two, one, episode 160. Brigadier General Dr. Robert Spaulding III, author of The Stealth War. Got you for 30 minutes, so I'll get right to it. I don't want to regurgitate your book to you because obviously you wrote it and you know all about it. But I've listened to it three times in the last week. And at the end, you have your, you have your, uh, your guide to combating uh, sino-aggression. And I emailed you some of my own questions, but I, I've reformulated them a little bit. And so I'll get right to it so I don't burn through my time. So the first one was, have you ever heard of the quote? Um, it's a Buddhist quote. There are two ways to go about uh, resisting pain. And the, the analogy is you can walk around the world barefoot and cover the entire earth in leather, or you can make leather shoes, which, you know, choose the easier one. So at the basis of what you describe as China at the very beginning of all of their multi-step um, tactics, they find a nation with the resource that they need, and then everything else comes after that. What do you think about removing the need for that resource, the creating leather shoes instead of covering the world in leather? Do you think that there is any opportunity for the U.S. to completely cut themselves off from China through asteroid mining? Do you think that that is a viable move to, because I know Jeff Bezos is interested in that. Do you think there is any viability in that uh, to get rid of our need for China? It's not, the, it's not the access to the resources, it's the processing of the resources. So what they do is uh, not only do they not have environmental concerns with regard to, for instance, rare earth minerals, uh, which our EPA does. So they put onerous uh, restrictions on those companies, make it really expensive to process the rare earth uh, metals that we have here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese subsidize it because they, they want to control it. So it's not access to the minerals itself. It's, it's, it's really just making a strategic determination that we need to process those so, so that we're not held hostage by a foreign power. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because I've read, I, I believe it was your, your book mentioned it, but I looked up on it more. China controls 90% of the rare earth metal trade, but only 30% of the actual supply. Right. I thought that was very interesting and an in important note. The other thing you mentioned in it is, um, towards the end, investing in AI as well as you use the analogy of um, the game Go, where they have to surround all the pieces to eliminate it. And that's one thing I've been thinking about a lot and I've spoken about on this podcast is the need for a hyper-intelligent AI because I've never played football in my life. You could give me 100 players and I would mess it up versus if you go to a Bill Belichick or a Tom Brady, you give them five players, but they'll maneuver those five pieces better than most people could maneuver 100. Do you think that we should be putting a greater importance and a greater amount of funding? You mentioned the funding under Carter and Reagan towards things like the F-117 Nighthawk or even SDI. Do you think we should be putting a, as I said in our email, a Manhattan Project-esque tone or um, hurried nature on AI so that we can meet China on the multifaceted, multi-tiered, seemingly multi-dimensional chessboard as they meet us on every different avenue with un unrestricted warfare? from their students to fishing to the Belt and Road Initiative, do you think that adding a, a hyper-intelligent AI could, could almost be a force multiplier to the things we already have? It's not about AI, it's about data. They have access to all the data because they have no data restrictions. Uh, the challenge we have is that you know, individual companies, individuals, um, government has data. In China, it's just one big pool of data that the government has access to. The, the problem is it's not secure and they don't protect uh, private information. So the challenge that we have is how do we um, use the data that's the resource of the United States people, of the American people? How do we use that in a way that protects their privacy, protects the security of their you know, own uh, intellectual property, but at the same time allows us as a nation to harness the data we have to make things better, cure cancer, cure Alzheimer's, you know, figure out how to make our transportation and logistics more efficient. All those things are, are things that AI can be useful for, but without the data, the, the comprehensive cumulative data that companies like Google or uh, Alibaba collect, um, we're not going to be able to do that. The problem we have today is that Google doesn't want to work with the government mm -hmm. and Alibaba only works for the government. 
Yeah. So there's a there's a there's a disparity here, and it's really about how do we how do we project project democracy and free trade, rule of law and uh, self determination in a digital world where the underlying technology was built for authoritarians. The mm -hmm. open data model is perfect for authoritarians because you accumulate data, you accumulate power. Mm -hmm. What we need is a way to lock down the data, ensure it's protected, but then also give AI the ability to have access to that data that protects privacy, that protects the intellectual property of the individual, but allows those macro effects that we can use on our society to be obtained. That's not AI. That's about a data system for the United States. And that's where on page 19, I say we need a secure nationwide 5G network. We need access to the data, but we need to also protect the privacy and security of each individual in each company's data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's almost like the quote, you can only be as good as the world allows you to be. It's, it's, we're, we're fighting someone that, that has no morals, no, no bottom tier, and we're trying to hold our, they're street fighting and we're still trying to keep the gloves on and, and, and not get any uh, points against us. It's, we don't even know what the fight is. We don't even know we're fighting. That, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah. We, we think everything's fine. No, yeah. we're getting our ass handed to us. That's the problem. So, you know, data, the way, so when you think about what I'm talking about, all, every, every bit of your data is, is locked down. It's encrypted. Nobody can have access to it. But you know what? You want a loan, right? You want, you want a loan to buy a car or a house. You want to be able to use Google Maps. Okay, well, then you have to have, a, you have, to have an agreement with those companies to use their resources. Mm -hmm. The agreement is they have access to your data. And then they promise you that I'm only going to use it for certain things. And then you find out that they didn't do that. Yeah. Then you can revoke access to that data. That's the kind of system that I'm talking about, where you have fine control and every relationship that you have in a digital sense is based on trust, based mm -hmm. on trust because you have power over your data. Today, we've created a system where only tech companies, large tech companies and authoritarian regimes have power over data. Nobody else has power over data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 I, I don't know. I don't know. So going to sort of, like you said, we don't even know that we're fighting. Most people don't want to know that we're fighting or have their head in the sand. And you said at best is negligence, at worst is traitorous and um, complicity. You mentioned, the, um, you mentioned the hacking and the sabotage of the Trans-Siberian Pipeline, which I had read about in Hoffman's Dead Hand, about the largest, largest non-nuclear explosion seen from space. Do you think that that is a necessary move for us against China? to instead of completely block them off, give them fried stuff, backdoor access, sabotage, ready? Certainly when it comes to um, theft uh, and particularly mil military capability, that may be an option, you know, but at the, at the, at the basic level, we produce innovation, technology, talent, and capital. If those things stay in this country, or only migrate to other democracies, we're going to be fine mm -hmm. because those other democracies practice rule of law and there's intellectual prop property protections in, in, in the whole nine yards. Sure. If we allow it to go to China, then we're basically allowing, you know, our future to be taken from us. And so it, we don't have to do anything about China. We just have to protect the resources that come out of a free society. And that's the whole point. So protect our the, the, the bounty that comes from the fact that we're a free people. Mm -hmm. We've just been giving it away and, and allowing it to be stolen uh, primarily because we don't have uh, you know, a secure data system, but mostly just because many people in this country just wanted to get rich and, and allowed it to be taken or yeah. it enabled their political power. So this is the problem that we have that you know, the wealth of this nation, innovation, technology, talent, and capital, by the way, we have 40% of the investable capital in the world. Capital drives business. You don't have money to run your business. You don't have a business. So this is a problem. It needs to go towards American businesses. These 70,000 plus communities that lost factories because China entered the WTO, nobody's investing in those communities. You can't, get a, you can't get a business loan there to build a factory. Nobody will finance that. If you are a startup, a high technology startup, nobody will give you money. Oh, let me take that back. China will give you money. Yes. It's, I mean, you're, you're right. I mean, my dad's from a small town in New England and you go to it and you can see, you can see the last 30, 40 years, how it's, how it's dying from the center. Cause there was a paper mill. That's just one of the 70,000 that was just kicked overseas. It used to be the center of 
of paper research in the world. It was one of the first places in the United States to have electricity. Now it's it's a ghost town. So on that note, with with cheap labor, because again, that is one of their strong suits, or what you said is now even China is outsourcing cheap labor, labor to Africa. Do you think that the playing field will be leveled with with automation? And then by leveling that playing field, so you go from dirt cheap labor at say Foxconn, where you're giving people a couple cents an hour and you have nets so they don't commit suicide. Do you think that we can level the playing field with automation and then the the um the coveted resources energy to drive those automated machines? Do you think that if we level that playing field, it will then come down to who can get the best, who can get the cheapest energy? So uh, let me go back to the town sure. in New England. Sure. Uh, not only did uh, that paper mill go away, but each of those jobs had health care and retirement benefits associated okay. with that, right? So we're talking about health care and retirement benefits today, and everybody's upset. Well, you know, the government needs to give us more. Well, that company was giving the, that town, the people of that town, those things. Now who has to pick it up when the company goes away? Yeah. The government, right? So what, what, what this association with the Chinese Communist Party is creating a socialism as a second order effect of, of the impact of losing that factory. Now to your point about cheap labor, it's not cheap labor. In fact, it's fairly uh, equivalent now. It's that they, they subsidize the companies. The companies get free electricity, for example. The government gives them free electricity um, on the labor. There is no labor standards. There's no environmental standards. They have scrubbers on their, on their coal plants. They just don't turn them on, right? So the place yeah. is full of uh, black smoke. Yeah. The, the challenge we have here is that we, you know, created environmental protections, labor protections, all of these things in this country. And then we told the companies, well, you don't have to abide by those because you can just go to China and, mm -hmm. and, and make higher margins. And we allowed that to happen, okay? So we, we offloaded slavery and, and, and pollution. But ultimately, your question is about automation and low energy costs, and that's what I'm hang, banging on all the time. We have some of the lowest energy costs in the OS, OECD. We have low corporate tax rates. We have opportunities, opportunity zones all over the country. All these communities want manufacturing, but you can't get it because companies like Blackstone are sending money to China and not investing it in our own communities. Now, where's Blackstone getting their money? They're getting their money from the pension funds. Yeah. So the pension funds are saying, I need you to make a, a bigger return because you know what? I don't have people paying into these pensions anymore. Nobody's working. So the pension, I need more higher return because I have all these retirees I have to pay for. So Blackstone says, I got to make higher margins in order to meet your requirements. I have to go to China. So it's this, this never ending cycle where we're in a death spiral. This country's in a death spiral and it's created because we don't understand the underlying problem is that we offloaded these factories and jobs from America and really destroyed the blue collar, the working class and the seed corn of our entire civilization, right? Mm -hmm. Not everybody is, you know, just grows up in a system where they can be white collar. Yeah. There is, there is a, we have like an ecosystem, an, an mm -hmm. economic ecosystem. And we, and we, so just like in a bio, uh, a biological system, ecosystem, you know, you kill off, you know, you got the deer, you got the wolves and you got the grass, you kill one of them off, you, you got collapse, right? Yeah. So yeah. what we have here is, is economic collapse in a sense that, we have all of these billionaires making lots of money because they've offloaded all this stuff and then they're selling cheap stuff from Walmart to the American people who don't have jobs. This is a problem. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's really a simple actually problem to, to fix. And your point about automation and energy, absolutely, absolutely. That's what 5G is about. It's about automating your factories and you pair that with, you know, the, nat the price of natural gas here in the United States, it's, it's like they're giving it, they're actually burning it off because they have so much. Good Lord. Yeah, you, had that, you had that great quote from, I believe you were quoting Steve Bannon. It was, uh, let's be perfectly frank, and I'm paraphrasing it. Let's be perfectly frank. Slaves in China build appliances funded by London and Wall Street for consumers in the West on welfare and unemployment. And you're like, it's not, it's not pretty. It's not sexy. That's what it is. And to me, that, that was like the smack across the face. I was like, oh, damn. So with, with energy, 
I've had on multiple uh, nuclear physicists on here, ones that doing current nuclear uh, fission research, ones that worked on atomic bombs and uh, thermonuclear weapons, but also two men from Oxford that are working on a fusion. Fusion is obviously, as you know, you're an intelligent individual, the, the, the holy grail. It's always just around the corner. ITER, I-T-E-R, is the, is the international fusion research in, I believe it's France. Everyone, everyone's doing that except China. They're doing their own. China is building nuclear reactors. We are not. Fusion is the holy grail. That is, you can run it. What is it? You need, you need 80 train cars of coal every day to get the same amount of power that half a train car of uranium per year can do which doesn't hold a match to, I believe it's a milliliter of deuterium for an entire year. So it is, it is the power of the sun. It is quite literally the thing that powers our world. Do you think that we should be doing, and I know I keep dropping this word, so it's probably losing importance and impact, a Manhattan project towards nuclear fusion. If we can get that seemingly endless resource, and by the way, you can extract the necessary fuel from seawater, if we could have that seemingly endless power source, you could just run automation. You could run it to almost what Eisenhower used to say, power too cheap to meter. We just never fulfilled it. Do you think if we really push for an operable nuclear fusion reactor, we could run everything at power too cheap to meter, and thus automation factories and kick China in the ass? So what we need is an energy policy, an energy strategy for the United States. We have to recognize we have energy needs today, mm -hmm. we have energy needs in the, in the midterm, and we have energy needs in the long term. And so we have to, we have to understand and take, take account of the resources we have. We have enormous natural gas and, and other petroleum reserves. We should take advantage of those while we can. Uh, we have uh, wind power, we have solar power, we should take advantage of those too. Um, we have molten salt re reactors, thorium, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, not enriched uranium yeah. actually can power, you know, very safe, you know, fail safe reactors. And, and we should do have those. And then, of course, we should work on fusion. But what we ought to have is a balanced strategy that actually allocates resources accordingly, according to what the you know, the, this, you know the, the, the language that's used in the military or in government research is, you know, uh, technology um, uh, risk level, right? Mm -hmm. So right now, fusion is a high uh, TRL, high technology risk level. Thorium reactors, kind of a medium. And then we know that natural gas is not a technology risk level. Yeah. So that we ought to be investing right now in the near, near term in getting molten salt reactors. Oh, by the way, they don't put off a lot of uh, nuclear waste like the old... Um, the old um, pressurized, um, yeah. you know, heavy water reactors. Yeah. Now, and you can't make and you can't make weapons from it. And then we ought to be we ought to be continue just like venture, you know, investors do. The government ought to be throwing money at fusion research. Yeah. But there ought to be a lot of different examples going on. You know, yeah. we've got this big ITER in um, in in France. Right. Yeah. You know, why don't we have at least ten different projects going yeah. on where yeah. Yeah. You know, we have, you balance your risk out. I mean, no, no venture capitalist in his right mind would say, I'm going to put all my money into this one project. Maybe it'll yeah. work. Yeah. No, they have like 20, 30 projects and one of them is going to work, but they don't know which one. They yeah. don't try to presuppose it. This is, yeah. this is common sense. But, you know, in government, we don't have, you know, common investment sent because they're politicians. They're not businessmen. Yeah. They don't know how to spend money and we yeah. shouldn't be given money to spend. But, you know, at the end of the day, Somebody has to make an energy strategy for the United States. Chevron's not going to do it. Chevron doesn't, doesn't care about that. That's not mm -hmm. their job. Mm -hmm. But the government needs to have people that understand business, understand the energy industry, and balances risks and say, okay, we need natural gas now. Maybe we're moving to molten salt reactors. But eventually, we'll get this fusion thing that we've been talking about for decades. Yeah. But, you know, it's going to take some time. And, and I think we ought to spread our money around. The yeah. problem here is we don't spend any money on science and uh, technology research. We right. were spending 2% of gross domestic product during the Cold War. Now, nothing. So, yeah. you know, get, let's start spending money. You know who's spending money on science and technology research? The Chinese. Yes, it's, it is their religion. For, for an atheistic communist nation, that is their religion. Yeah, you said it, you said it in your book, 2% of GDP towards things like stealth research. And now it's something like, what, 0 0.5? Not even. I mean, we look at things like, how do we go to the moon in 69? It's 5% of GDP. 
Like if you want it done, it can happen. It like, can happen. Of yeah. course it can. Yeah. The way I just, the way I describe it is, is like, man, there's nothing better than when uh, another guy tries to flirt with your wife or girlfriend. There's nothing that's going to kick your ass into gear to get in the gym more. A little competition gets you going. I think we could look at China as a, as a positive, not, not them, but hell, what is going to get you out of well, there? So you got a good point right there, right? Competition. Yes. So now what the politicians on the right, right and left think about, they think about competition between either the right or the left. It's not a competition with no. each other. It's no. a competition with the Chinese Communist Party. They want to take yeah. us over. They want us to be in the dumps, right? That's yeah. what I, when I was at the White House, we got in a big fight. You know, who's a panda hugger? Who's not? <laughs> I don't care. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That's past. But in the past, yeah. we have to figure out how to fix our shit right now. It's yeah. about America. It's not about right or left. You know, yeah. DC wants to convince you that if you don't get all the Democrats in office, yeah. you know, it's going to be terrible if you don't get all the republicans in congress it's just going to be terrible baloney it's about america it's about the constitution it's about preserving our republic and the competition is not the other side the competition is the chinese communist party and you know who says that a lot of our billionaires you know who else says that a lot of our allies and partners hey the chinese are got something going they're growing their economy what are you guys doing fighting we're bickering at each other we're you said he said see and meanwhile the chinese the tick on the world is just swelling it has anaconda tentacles that's that's the imagery i kept getting reading your book was just an anaconda slowly going around the world and it's just it's getting ready to constrict but we can't see it because it's in slow motion um yeah you mentioned venture capitalists in multiple different angles it's a, a beating it to death the manhattan project we had multiple different enrichment centers for fissile mm -hmm. material in case one of them didn't work we had the B reactor. We had all we had the ones in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, Lawrence Livermore. We we're putting it all together. They didn't even know they had a 10, a factor of 10 um, margin of error. They were like, you know, we might need a gram of uranium. We might need 10. So it was just throw it all, throw it all over. Even, I mean, think about the ones we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those were two completely different ones. It was implosion and gun type, plutonium and uranium. It was we spread it all, and then in case that didn't even work, going off into a side tangent, we were doing that thing where we were going to put incendiary bombs on bats and throw them in uh, Tokyo. So we have all these different plans going about it. So yeah, we should be having our own eater here. We should be doing other things. What about helium-3 mining on the moon? What about the idea of putting kilometer-wide solar panels in space and then beaming it back down to Earth via mi uh, microwave radiation? There are multiple different things we should be doing. Um, got five more minutes with you. Do you think that, I wanted to touch on it because you mentioned it in your book, not really in the way that I thought, SDI, do you think that, or do you know that, do you think that that would be our final all else fails against China? Do you think we do have an operational SDI with directed energy weapons? Because at the very end, you have to prepare for the absolute worst. It's like, be kind to everyone you meet, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet. All else fails. Do you think that there is importance to have a an impenetrable missile shield, or do you think that, that that really can't be done? Is that just impossible? What's important is the preservation of our society, and there's two, two components to that. There's there's creating a, a nation that enables each individual to reach their true potential. Mm -hmm. And then there is, you know, protecting us from a military attack. So if you go back to the Cold War, mm -hmm. uh, a, there's a good book, Thinking about defense, it's written by a guy named Lieutenant General uh, um, Glenn Kent, and it's a very it's a short book he wrote while he was at Rand. And he basically he was a mathematician for the Air Force, a three star at, when he retired. And what he figured out is uh, in 1958, I believe is a year that would cost 23 billion dollars to build a missile shield over the United States that would protect 70 percent of the population. Here's the kicker. If you want to protect 90% of the population, it would cost six times more. Yeah. And here's the bigger kicker. For every dollar of offense the Soviets added, you had to add $6. Yeah. So when, when he looked at it, he said, we're going to go bankrupt trying to, to create a missile shield. So what did they do? They said, okay, if you do anything, we're going we're gonna to destroy the Soviet Union. So they basically turned it into... You know, we're gonna we're gonna build our society. We're gonna build you know great things like the Eisenhower National Highway System. Mm -hmm. We're going to you know really create this this high power economy with the space race and 
all of this science and technology research and all of these grants for STEM education degrees. So our scientists and engineers can be the smartest in the world and, and really come up with technology and new businesses and the Eisenhower Highway System allowed for you know, transportation that, that grew commerce across the country. And then what we're gonna tell the Soviets is, you do anything and we're gonna use these nuclear weapons that we have and we'll just wipe you out. How about that? Is that a good idea? No. So they, what do they say? Well, we don't want to be wiped out. Okay, well, then we're not going to do anything. Yeah. And that went on for 40 years. And you know what? We won. Why? Yeah. Because they went bankrupt and we didn't, right? We were, we were, our economy was growing. The end of the Cold War, we're the most powerful. What do you think China's doing right now? Same thing. The same thing. Same. They're watching us go bankrupt. So they built this very effective military in, in the Indo-Pacific. And we're like, huh. How do we break that? More trillions, more trillions, more trillions. We can break it. No, we, they, no, we can't. It's in their backyard. And so if we really want to, you know, you know think about the Indo-Pacific, if we really want to protect, you know, countries like Japan and South Korea and, and Taiwan, well, then maybe we have to think differently like we did during the Cold War. It, it, we can't spend all our money buying weapons to break a problem that was designed not to be not to break the bank in China. It's yeah. designed to break the bank in the United States. And that's what it's doing because yeah. we're instead of spending on science and technology research, STEM education, infrastructure and manufacturing, like we were doing during the cold war, we're spending on F 35s mm -hmm. and, you know, two, uh, you know, nuclear powered uh, aircraft carriers, nuclear subs, you know, all of these exquisite weapon systems that when you look at what the array of weapons that China has, so now you got a, you got a, you know, maybe $10 million missile that can take out a, you know, a $30 billion aircraft carrier. Yeah. What? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you can't, you can't fight against that. It's yeah. Got, I've got, I've got three more minutes. I could talk to you for 10 hours. So three quick questions. One, what is it like to fly B2 Spirit? <laughs> what is, is it? Yeah, what is that like, awesome. man? It's, it's just, awesome. Oh. It's awesome. It's awesome. And and you know the cool thing about flying the B two is I could I could uh, I could fly that. Um, you really tremendous. You know the best weapon system ever designed in the history of mankind to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I could get in a T thirty eight that was you know designed to teach pilots to fly the F one hundred series fighters and pull G's and go upside down and do mock dog fights. You know, so I had the best of both worlds. You could you could fly both airplanes in, at Whiteman because you only got to fly the B two you know once or twice a month. Oh, I'm so jealous. Yeah, I I called Northrop Grumman a couple months ago and tried to get a comment on the future B twenty one, and uh, I was promptly chewed out. <laughs> Not to mention that, so I was like, okay, all right, I won't bring that up. Two more questions, or a second to last question. So when I had on Mike Durant, the quote unquote Black Hawk Down guy. I asked him about what he thought about the, the stealth helicopter that went down during the bin Laden raid. And all politics aside, what did he think about the helicopter? And he cracked a smile and said, man, I'd like to take that thing for a ride around the block. <laughs> what do you think about all these, these Pentagon uh, reports coming out about UFOs? Is all political and philosophical implications aside, is there a part of you as a pilot that looks at that thing and you're like, oh, I'd like to take that thing for a whip? Well, you know, um, I've never seen anything. Uh, so I tend to be skeptical, skeptical, okay. you know, I look, I, I'm a Catholic. Okay. So I believe in God, but everything else you got to show me. Right. And these yeah, yeah. pictures where you got, you know, fuzzy visit videos. I mean, come on. Yeah. It, yeah. It, do we have UFOs? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I just don't, I tend not to believe that we do, but yeah. you know, maybe I'm just, Maybe I'm just too skeptical. Oh, I'm with you. I, I want to believe. I, that, I'm not biased. I want to believe. It's just, yeah, it's, it's 2020 and we still can't get anything. Well, I mean, well, here's, here's a question. Are All they right. doing recon so they can wipe us out? I mean, well, if that's, that's the thing that you got to be worried about. You look at what's going on down here. That could be a possibility. Okay, these guys, you know, brains are really tasty. We're going to. Yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah. I mean, one thing that's the scary thing. One thing I always think about is if us and the Soviets did uh, proxy wars in, in the East, who's to say that this right now isn't a proxy war? Why wouldn't they use us? That, yeah. that kills me. Last question. So I'm sure you're aware of the website Reddit. It's, do you ever use Reddit? Have you ever used Reddit? R-E-D-D-I-T? Yeah. My, my son, right after I left the military, my son got me to do an AMA. AMA yeah. and, I, and like three people asked me questions. And I'm like, 
Screw them. <laughs> I'm like, come well, on. Well, Reddit, screw them. That's terrible. That's a sin. Well, last year, Reddit took $300 million from Tencent, which, as you yeah, know, they yeah, CCP yeah, company. Yeah. And since then, they have scaled up censorship to a level that would make Orwell blush. Right. Last year, they or the, early this year, they kicked off the subreddit, The Donald, which is right, which right. got everyone going. They kicked that off, and they created their own website. It's just right. called thedonald.win. They love you there. There are memes of you, your face photoshopped, and it's you beating up China, or you fighting Winnie the Pooh, or it's 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 always Robert Spaulding. It's just the, it's pictures of you, and it's just a jawbone you could sharpen a blade on. I just want you to know they love you. They absolutely love you there. That's hilarious. They, they That's hilarious. You. More people pitch your book. Have you read Stealth War? What are you doing? Like so, I just wanted to say that they love you, and That's cool. They do. They really do. So, is there any chance I can just get? You just get you to say shout out to Donald. They love you. <laughs> shout out to Donald. Sh the Donald. Shout out to the Donald. Yes, <laughs> they love you. You're an American hey, here. Look, look, I look. I don't care if you're from the right or the left. Sure. You know, I'm an American. I stand for the Constitution. You know, this country is great. Um, I, I, I don't have. I don't hate any Americans. I don't care what you think. Right. Right. right? right? But, you know, we can't be a Marxist country. We can't, um, w you know, this country is a melting pot. It's really about us all coming here and, and, and just throwing away tribalism because everybody that comes here is an immigrant. So they leave behind their, you know, their baggage of the past and their, and their associations. And they come here and they, and they basically build a life. And they build a life, most of them, particularly the immigrants, which is why I like hanging out with Im immigrants the most, yeah. because they're like, this place is great. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. nobody's there to persecute you you yeah. don't have to go you know pay somebody's uncle so that you can get a license to run your business you know people don't understand that because they've been here too long and they don't you know, they don't go and live in other places and you know they say oh this place is terrible and 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 there's so much hatred look bias is a feature of every society mm -hmm. it is a feature of mankind Mm -hmm. This country and this constitution is the best, you know, armor we have against that. So, mm -hmm. you know, it. Um, I, 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 I totally like the, the, the interview, and, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Oh yes, sir. Th thank you. For, and yes, for the as, as much as I lean more to the right, I, I always say. I mean, thank God that there is a competition of ideas in this country where people from the right and the left can go at each other's throats. And then go have a beer, and no one's throwing in a reeducation camp. Amen. That's what's beautiful. Thank you, sir. You're a patriot. You are Paul Revere 2.0 instead of the red coats. It's it's the Chicoms, but I loved your book. Thank you so much for doing this, sir, and God bless. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. You have a good one.